Hello and welcome to Eclecticist. What is Eclecticist? Eclecticist is an investigation of everything from a British perspective by two brothers who consider themselves to be normal chaps who discuss one topic at a time. We choose a topic of interest, spend a little time researching it, have a discussion, and then we publish the notes. The reason we do this is to foster a greater understanding of the world before death and to hopefully prompt further thought and discussion. We are me, Benjamin de Campos, a designer and believer. And me, Jeffrey Campos, an engineer and let's face it, a skeptic. In this show, we'll be discussing professional critics. Everybody's a critic. In essence, review is criticism, which is judgment. We all do it, and we all commonly listen to the criticism by others. In our day to day lives, we develop opinions and judge the merits and demerits of virtually everything with the intention of basic discrimination. In this show, we will talk about criticism in the celebrity sense, as used by those in the trade. We're criticizing professional critics, their motivations, values, weaknesses, and utility, if any. What we're absolutely not going to talk about is classical criticism, that is the philosophical sense of criticism, and the methodology employed by critics and the methodology of philosophical criticism. Why? Because those are incredibly broad topics, they're fairly contentious, and they're out of scope for what we consider to be contemporary criticism. Let's start by defining criticism. What do we mean? What is a critic? Well, I looked up the Oxford English Dictionary and I found that a definition of a critic, that is a noun, is one who pronounces judgment on any thing or person, especially one who passes a severe or unfavorable judgment, a censurer, a fault finder, a caviller, particularly interesting word, cavil, a cavil is someone who makes petty objections. And then I looked up critique, another noun. A critique is an essay or an article in criticism of literary or more rarely artistic work. It's a review, basically. And then, of course, there's the intransitive, that's criticize. And if you criticize, you are playing the critic. You're passing judgment upon something with respect to its merits or its faults. And these days, that's pretty much connoting unfavorable judgment. It's, uh, it's denigrating to criticize someone. So there are different aspects to what a critic is, and... That shapes how people feel about criticism and how people consider critics and overall their worth and their value uh, when considering the arts and sciences and, let's face it, everything you can possibly criticize. Uh, the definition of a professional critic is somebody who strives to get paid for their critical works. So this can be a person who believes that they have insight or they have some value to offer to others with regards to the creative output of another individual or a team or a corporation or whatever it might be. We should probably make it clear that, uh, again, that we're talking about professional critics, not talking about, you know, your mate who might uh, talk about a film. Well, everybody's a critic. Everyone's a critic, but we're talking about professional critics. And I think that's, that's key <clears throat> because it's my contention that uh, professional critics will occasionally um, give their views, but there's normally more to their views than they're probably letting on, in my view. Well, I think so. Absolutely. Which, again, I think it, it, that's why it's important to distinguish between the different words involved in criticism. Again, when I think of a critique, I think about an analysis or an essay. I think it's something that is taking something apart in order to examine all of the components and to see how whatever the whole is works. And uh, I've read lots of critiques of various things. And indeed, it's, it's an academic sort of essay, an analysis, as I say. But it really gets down to the nitty gritty. It sort of is reductionist in that it cuts whatever it is that's being critiqued into its component parts to the smallest level. It really divides it up. And I've seen, I've read movie reviews, for instance where it gets so incredibly granular that it just 
gets complicated to the point where you don't even know what they're talking about anymore. <laughs> well, that's something else. Uh, again, um, for example, you know, uh, I consider myself a musician of sorts, and uh, you've often said about whether or not I'm in actually listening to the music or enjoying the music, or am I just listening to the um, the specific chord structures or the you know. Well, you lose the magic yeah, if you start like if you start working out exactly how it all functions. Um, indeed, and I'm sure, yeah. Uh, when I read or hear certain film reviewers, for example, it certainly does sound to me like they're just watching the film and ticking boxes. Um, in fact, Mark Commode, uh, the um, film reviewer for the flagship film program on the BBC Radio, he. Um, he often has expressions like uh, tab A and slot B and things like Jargon. that. Jargon. Yeah. Of course, tab A and slot B doesn't make sense. It should be no. tab A and slot A. Obviously. <laughs> but they can see behind the curtain. Uh, so again, it's a, a magician can appreciate the work of another magician, but a magician cannot be awed quite as commonly as a non-magician with magical works. Well, I mean, that, that's interesting because we're getting into like another area, which is um, kind of a bugbear of mine. Um, if I'm, you know, uh, want a review of good magicians, uh, does this make sense? This might not make sense. Um, I'll take it back to movie re the, the movie reviewing analogy. Uh, I'd rather hear what um, someone I know has to say about a film rather than see a film because a critic says so. But your friend could be hideously misinformed. He could And your friend may not be aware of related films or related works that are vastly superior to the one that he just well, seen. But the reason why I say Perhaps that... Perhaps he's, he's, he's perpetrating a gross injustice towards someone who had created a greater work in a similar vein or... Well, it's a case-by-case -case thing. Um, but the reason why I say that isn't possibly for the reason you, 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 you think. It's more for... Um, oh, okay. Uh, a way to analogize this would be speaking as a designer. You know, occasionally I'll be working on something, um, and you know, I can't really see wood for trees, and I'll need the opinion of a non-designer to look at it, who won't look at it like I will, and tell me what he or she thinks. Um, you know, getting the man in the streets view of it, and I feel very much the same way about films. It's like if uh, a, re a reviewer will probably well. Mark Kermode, again, is an example. He too often will recommend a film because he likes things that aren't to do with the film. Like he likes the, the director um, or some other reason like that. Uh, and again, that puts me off um, doing anything on the say-so of, of a professional critic. No, I suppose. But I think you would wonder, I certainly wonder, why someone would become a critic. So I thought about this. I thought, you know... Would I want to become a critic? And in fact, being a critic is enjoyable. It's enjoyable to criticize something, especially if you know something about it. So typically, most critics have something to do with whatever their subject matter is. In their chosen field, they were a player at some point, maybe a failed player or a successful player. Well, there you Wherever go. they are, they have a lot of experience in, in their chosen field. And they feel as though they have a lot to contribute because they feel that they have a lot of expertise in that area. And I think if you can negotiate yourself into that position, then it feels good to take something apart, to examine it, to understand the influences, to, f to see where it came from, to see where it could potentially lead. All of this is good information that you feel as though there is a, a benefit to to publishing that and to spreading it around and proselytizing other people and to the way that you think. Basically, changing the way people think or bringing people around to the way you think is pleasurable inherently. Mm. And I think that's an appeal of becoming a critic. Um, in my, in my it's interesting because you've stumbled into two areas there. Uh, was I stumbling? No, you weren't stumbling. Um, you're actually being very generous to uh, professional critics by the word you say, because you said they might have been a player. I presume you mean in that chosen field um, and failed. And I think you've hit the nail on the head with that. I mean, it's very 
well, it's not well known, but it's it's often said that music critics, um, for example, music critics for who write for the NME, um, are often uh, derided as failed musicians, who through um, who who use their platform as a uh, music critic uh, to settle some scores or just to lash out um, or some other. Um, manifestation of sour grapes uh, political gaming yeah but i i think also it's a kind of um well well clearly uh screw you um world uh you'll be sorry and uh using their using their power and again when you say it's pleasurable i think what also comes into that is ego i think um it makes them feel great to have power uh, and to trample something into the ground um, and stand tall, uh, snidely make these comments, sneer, um, bully, basically. There's a... They're Nazis. Well, <laughs> there's one critic. Uh, her name escapes me, but she writes for one of the uh, rags. Um, gosh. And she was writing... Uh, a musical critic. No, it's not. Um, I think it was for... It, was one of these, it might be The Guardian, I'm not sure. We'll pop this in the show notes. Yes. Um, and she was she was writing about um, Sandy Togsvig. Now, I can't stand Sandy Togsvig. Mo hardly anyone can stand her. Um, she's very um, polarizing, I'd say. I don't particularly like her very much. Um, now, I read uh, this... I can't remember who it's by. It's on the tip of my brain, the woman who wrote this. But she um, absolutely tore into Sandy Togsvig on a real personal level. It was really nasty. And these are adults. Um, and these are adults talking about living people. And it just, it was like school. It was like bullying at school. And every time I read something or hear something or critique uh, speaking, and they go personal, um, I often switch off at that point. Um, in fact, recently I was listening to uh, a sort of hero of mine, Christopher Hitchens, a well-known journalist and polemicist, journalist and polemicist, the late Christopher Hitchens. And every time he would talk about um, the Archbishop of Canterbury, he would say sheep-faced loon. Or if he spoke about uh, Prince Charles, he'd say uh, bat-eared, no taste in women, Muslim fancying lunatic, you know, something like that. And it's just, well, that's not necessary. Why can't you use your wit, your intelligence to be a little bit more creative, not just dish out insults? Well, no, but it can be entertaining. I mean, you used to be a great fan of Gerald Scarf, for instance. Indeed. And he just is horrifically personal with his targets and it seems immensely cruel well, was, to my mind. Yeah, but I was a fan. But he does it in a witty kind of way with a, a lot really. of art, art, artistry. I, I, would well, I would argue he doesn't. Jumping back to uh, music criticism, I find it interesting in my, experience, my limited experience of music, music criticism that uh, musicians very rarely criticize each other's work. I can't ever think of any occasion when well, a, a musician there's, there's criticizes a another musician no indeed but i, I think it's interesting that no, I, I it just... happens all the time does so. it well it does really and but and it usually makes big headlines you know because it's gossip like for example um but rarely sure well uh there is a middle-aged rap singer rap singers you know rap singers yes um called uh eminem and he would, uh, in his uh, songs, rapping about how brilliant he is, he will often throw out these barbs to other musicians in the media. No, Mofo, Mojo, Moco. Um, uh, Moby. Moby. Yeah. Um, Moby and uh, Limp Biscuit and uh, all this other crap. Uh, but his, but I think that's all part of the act, really. No, absolutely. Oh, actually, and it was amazing no, that Moby took offense. I'm not going to give him that. It's not part of the act because. Um, He's just a believer in his own hype. No, he's an actor. Well, I'm sure he is to a certain extent, but when you've got that, well, again, I mean, this is another, uh, this is another um, uh, contention I have, which is um, the, I mean, this is for another podcast, but what I'm saying is musicians who have a uh, large fan, a large fan base, they're, they're, they're only humans. 
And so what does that adjuration do to their brains? It makes them actually think that they are amazing superhuman. So Eminem really can get on his highest of high horses and uh, sound like a total idiot um, and wave his hands about. But when he's criticizing other musicians, I mean, that's incredibly rare. Ah, no, what I have is to say not? about that is the reason why musicians don't want to say, don't want to diss other musicians is because it's a kind of um, gushing, backslapping world uh, where and a, and a small world, incestuous world, yes, indeed, where you know what goes around comes around, and if you gush about one band, they might gush about you back, or, or indeed you can uh, you can you can really heavily criticize someone's work and then find yourself sitting next to them in an awards ceremony, and uh, it becomes very socially awkward. So uh, I, I guess, and again, everybody's so delirious, you know, in the celebrity world, uh, certainly in music. Uh, where everybody's just delirious over the fact that they're so rich and they're they're doing so well, they they gen generally mellow out. They don't really want to upset anybody or hurt anybody's feelings. I think. I mean, you know. Well, yeah, but again, you could make a case that they lose their um, integrity. It's you know they, they're artists. They're meant to um, not suppress... produce albums on a schedule. Well, indeed, yeah. Well, there's, that's a compromise, but they're not meant to suppress their 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 raw thoughts well, perhaps, anyway we're getting off topic with yeah, this per one. perhaps we should just uh, discuss the different types of critics um we have the polemicist as you've uh, you uh, mentioned earlier christopher hitchens a polemicist somebody who is instructional um they're given to uh, disputes and controversy they're a bit contentious in their views uh they're combative occasionally uh very entertaining uh, of course, we have literary critics who, uh, they, again, they're very subjective. They read a lot of books. Uh, they describe the books. They describe how the books are put together. And they criticize on highly technical levels. They criticize on their emotional response uh, from the books. Uh, we have film critics. Again, films are a little bit different. Uh, the universes that are imagined by the producers are visualized and you're able to criticize the visual aspects of the content that's coming at you. We have musical critics, again, it seems to me highly subjective and uh, particularly dependent on the immediate environment and how the critic or the listener is feeling at any particular time. You know, music can, can evoke memories uh, like smells particularly well yeah music we, criticism is particularly uh, it's probably among the worst yeah um for example the the critics will um talk about um popular music or whatever but you need to take a step back and say well why are those songs in our ears who decides what well it seems played? very corrupt perhaps the most corrupt aspect of uh, professional criticism and uh, we'll get back to that yeah so. food critics food critics are uh again Amazingly subjective, very powerful, very persuasive, and seriously derided, generally. Um, they're peculiar in that they usually are very anonymous. They try and really hide their identities because they need to. They're going to the restaurant and they're reviewing the food. They don't want to affect the food that they're having delivered. Unlike a film critic, a film critic goes along to a film, watches the movie. You cannot change the movie. You cannot consider the critic being in the the cinema and watching the film there's nothing you can do you've produced the film and you just have to wait for their criticism however food critics uh, you can you can alter the menu you can change things subtly you can drug the food there's lots of things you, you know, can do again, it's performance art you're, you're being too generous with that suggesting that there's nothing you could do to sway the view of a movie critic i think there's loads of things oh well that yes does of course, but not not with respect to the actual film i mean you can give them roses and chocolates and champagne and free plane tickets but you cannot actually change well, the film no you can't but you don't need to um for example i mean I've, I've already mentioned him but i'll mention him again mark kermode mark kermode um who i enjoy i should say that um i i think that he uh a lot of his views um that he espouses i think there's more to it than that in fact there's a film but he's not a director He's not a director. And he's not an actor. He's not. No. Which which differs from food critics. Typically, food critics really are ex-trade or still in the trade. Right. They really are typically restaurant owners. They've worked in restaurants. They've, uh, they've, they are successful in, the, in their field. Right. But film critics are different 
considerably different in that they typically are not film producers and have never been no, film but producers. It's, it's just a different world, though, because I think a film critic, particularly someone as high profile as Mark Commode, I think he can say something, you know, he, he can have a view on a film, and that makes such a difference in terms of footfall in cinemas. Whereas with a movie critic, you know, there's only one restaurant, you know, how much damage will that do? Well, probably quite a lot to the restaurant, but I mean, it's not, <laughs> it, it just doesn't have the same volume of, no, well, of change. No, there is that. There's there's influence by numbers, which of mean, course. Which, which is why I think someone like Commode is far more corruptible. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure as sincere as he would like to be, I shouldn't keep leveling this at Commode because it's, it's all of them, basically. But for example, it's a film that he, um, he was right there at the inception of it. It's about the Nazis going to the moon. And in such and such a year, they come back. What's it called? Iron Iron Sky. Right. Have you heard about this film? I have heard about it. Okay. And uh, Commode was pretty chummy with the directors who put this trailer together of this film. I think they're Dutch or something like that. Um, and it was always just a trailer. And these directors were always looking for funding. A funding was, was eventually um, sourced. But Commode was always very... Um, uh, always giving them a lot of time and always talking about their project and probably had quite a lot to do with getting them the funds. And when the film was eventually made, I went to go see it and I thought it was a terrible film. I thought it was really, really unfunny. And it had just so much wrong with it. Um, and it had this real anti-American um, streak in it, which is nothing new about that, but it was handled so clumsily and it was so boneheaded. And it was the kind of film that I'm sure Mark Commode would have just absolutely went nuts uh, ripping apart. But because he had so much to do with the film directors and all the rest of it, when he eventually gave his review, he was saying, you know, it, it, it's, it's good. It's, uh, he was almost lost for words. And, he will have had to have been. Well, that's the thing. But you could just see it in his face that he was really... Um, What's losing his integrity losing his integrity is one way to put it it's a dreadful film but it happens all the time it's like there's a film that's just come out called uh pacific rimming oh yes uh del toro one of his films right benito del toro yeah something like that um anyway but it's it's like a michael bay film it's you know, ro robots hitting other robots you know and uh commode has went mental at times um going off on one about michael um michael bay Really, you know, a uh, commodian rant of epic proportions, but really soft pedaled <laughs> with Pacific Rim <laughs> was like uh, he and when he's challenged about his um, his uh, apparent soft pedaling and his double standards and his was uh, he challenged lack of integrity? Yeah, well, you know what the BBC's like they'll you know the, the BBC fairness you go they'll real read one person's email that thinks oh yeah absolutely agree with you then for balance sake we'll read this email. God, it was rubbish. But someone put it to Kermode that, gosh, if Michael May would have made that film, you would have went mental. And um, Kermode just went off on one. L kind of like a little petulant child. And that's the thing. That's where ego comes into it, I think, with these reviewers. I think they will never or rarely admit that they're wrong. For example, Kermode will make up his mind about a film and someone will come up with an amazing um, counterpoint. Uh, but he just his mind is just not open to change. Uh, he's not open to counter argument, and he he sticks his heels in and stays doggedly, even though someone might have made a very valid point. But he won't change his view. And that I, I, I so you can change your view from a critic can make you change your view. You can change your view, view personally. On, well, if we consider movies as the example. If you watch a movie and you're watching the film and you're enjoying it and it's really good and you walk out of the cinema and you think, oh, that was really good. I really enjoyed that. But subsequently, a critic, for sake of argument, could describe to you how that film was awful. Mm. Can you change your view retrospectively? Uh, I think that has happened. Um, it certainly happened in the case. Would of it happen to the point where you would say you didn't actually enjoy the film? I don't know about that. I think it was certainly a case of uh, the Ridley Ridley Scott film, The Prometheus. Awful. Well, you've changed your view. I certainly have not. Well, it was an insult. Well. Well. 
Okay, well, we'll say that for another I time. always maintained that that was an awful film. Well, I, I, at first, I thought it was an awful film when I watched it at the cinema. But I noticed the film uh, stayed rattling around my brain. And I actually think it was Commode who championed that film. Again, I think he championed it because Ridley Scott's such a good mate of his. Um, but he championed that film. And he did make me think about it. And the film was very confusing. had so many loose ends. But he made me consider that well that's first the first film of this new generation of alien films and they're not going to give away everything in the first film no indeed it was an insult to science so <laughs> just to, to round off our different types of critics the last one in the list was art art critics again very interesting what is it you could criticize about a piece of art to me it seems to be that art critics are historians they're historians simple as that whenever they consider any kind of art they look back at a huge line of influences. And they think, well, they, they and they categorize and subcategorize and they try to, they, they build a taxonomy in order to judge any particular art, where it is placed, the effects that it has, how it was affected. And really there's so much to it, but it's, it's almost programmatic in how causal it is. It's absolutely incredible. But I think it's important for us to talk about the power of critics, because they certainly are powerful. They, they are indeed. But I think you, we should talk a little bit more about art critics, um, because I think that probably is, uh, again, one of the worst. Because when we say art, I mean, that's fairly broad. Are we talking about painterly arts or performance arts or oh, okay. yeah, good point. architecture, sculpture? Um, gosh. Macrame? I, okay, well, I th- I th- we'll stick to being broad uh, at this point, but it's like, what's the name of that chap? He's quite well known, Sewell. Sewell, yes. Brian Sewell. Yeah, he is someone who can waffle on um, in the most pretentious and... Uh, what are the words? Are well, an incredible things? level of erudition, though. I don't know. See, but I, I think that's more for effect. Really? Well, it's, not a, it's a fact. He knows an awful lot okay. about art. He yeah. really does. You cannot take that away no, from No, no, no. Okay. But I, I do think he's like a kind of show person. I think Aren't he, they all? Well, he, him in particular. He, I mean, crit- critics are performance artists. But he's, you know, he, he, he's such a caricature. I think he's wheeled out. Oh, let's hear Brian Sewell. But what I was going to say before we go down that road was um, it's quite... There's a number of instances where artists will be um maybe not artists in the truest sense and put something out as a joke only for art critics to read a whole load of stuff into the, their what they've done and in doing so completely reducing everything that art critics stand for to nonsense it's just or to an argument well you you argue for the popularity Argue for the popularity. What do you mean? So what I mean is the prescriptive or proselytizing nature or power that critics have. For instance, they can take anything and they can argue for its value Mm. and push its popularity onto the uh, unsuspecting sheep-like public. Yes, indeed. I mean, mean, there was a a famous experiment where they tried to popularize a completely untalented group of (laughs) singers and created a boy band i think it was a girl band What's this? and they were so ridiculously <laughs> is untalented this, is this vanilla no no it I, is, I, is no it? way no way i don't know I don't yeah remember. yeah but i remember reading about it there's all barnet yeah it was just her- horrendous yeah but they were awful and they did get them up the charts but they, <laughs> but anyway uh with with okay with, with art critics in particular art is um just a whole different world really i mean with a band you've you know music is fairly broad in appeal and a band can play music and people can nod their heads Whereas with art, it really just takes a few select art critics to sort of scratch their chins to get an, an artist sort of off the ground. And I often wonder just how many artists with more integrity are being sidelined because they didn't have the right knobby friends to put them in front of No, them. absolutely. And, and again, I think there's a real scope. I think it's important to discuss the economic factors when we consider the power of critics because in, in, the, in the case of painterly art, you can really turn a canvas and some oil paints, which perhaps cost collectively £100, because the prices are outrageous, into £100,000. Just by, just through the power of persuasion, your personal social contacts, Mm. and 
a really good and convincing argument mm. and maybe a little bit of luck in the end doing it at the right time but you can take <laughs> what i mean to say is that you can take raw materials yes. and you can add you can value add um a colossal amount of money effectively just inventing money from mm. nothing and well, you can do that if you know the right people yes and you know a really compelling argument and you release that argument upon your target audience at the right time well, again, you've kind of stumbled into my whole argument, which is all of these people are infinitely corruptible. Um, they're not, you know, you seem quite generous in the way you describe what they do as having so much um, merit and all this kind of thing. Whereas I tend to think they're on a public platform and they know how powerful they are and they've got people falling over themselves to give them all sorts of uh, bungs and um, I just don't trust anything they say. Um, because what they say can make the difference of a hundred pounds to a million pounds, like you just said. Gosh, well, there's a list here in our show notes about the power of critics. Let me just run down that list. Um, I think critics can be particularly powerful through curation. I think curation is becoming more and more interesting and certainly more and more um, powerful. And what I mean by curation is that it's a busy world. We're all very busy. There's a an awful lot of media out there that needs to be consumed by somebody. The overall standard, in my opinion, of media is rising. I think the average pop song these days is an awful lot better than the average pop song from the '80s. And better. Uh, the in what way better? a lot just just better, better production values, better sound quality, better lyrics. Look, it's just when I hear pop music today. And I'm not a follower I, of pop music, but when well, I hear pop music, it seems to me to be a lot more tolerable than pop music was yesteryear. Well, I think that's... And also consider television programs. Television programs now that, seem an no, awful lot better than they ever were. I think that is different between music and TV programs. I think music is just as bad, but a different kind of bad. It's clearer bad. Yeah, it's, it's, it's well-produced bad. It's just terrible. It's just as bad, in fact. It's awful. Okay. It's just so, auto-tuned. Right. It's awful. And... We're agreed. Yeah, no, but we're agreed. But <laughs> the, power of, think... the power of curation I'm talking about. There is so much media. And there's, you know, an, for every bad piece of music, or perhaps every ten pieces of really awful music, there may be one really, really rather good piece of music. And again, just as a pure scale, um, there's a lot more media that is available to us. And critics can curate for us. They can create playlists of music. They can create things that we should be seeing. We have lists and cues of things that we need to consume. And uh, we're given these curated packets of media. And, uh, and we're happy about that. Hmm. I think curation is, is really important. On Again, the web, obviously. That's trusting judgment. No, absolutely. But uh, you want to just offset your you, you've got so many other things to do you'd really rather you know subcontract out having to find good things to listen to or good things to watch you want people to make those decisions for you and uh curation curation from critics steps in and everybody's a critic so curation is happening you know the accessibility of the web and crowd sorcery mm. um curation can come from every direction yeah but again uh, if you've got people on the web being the curators, they might be even worse. But it becomes meritocratic, <laughs> though. Well, I mean, you may at least have the time in your life to determine whether or not critic A is curator A is uh, is delivering more joy yeah. to you than yeah, yeah. curator B. Uh, another point is uh, academic. Critics can be incredibly academic. They can be really thrillingly academic. You know, again, they can analyze a uh, a, a film or book to the extent which it's just so alarmingly enlightening hmm. that it makes you re-appreciate the book or hmm. appreciate the book from, from a different angle. You didn't realize that what they were trying to create here was X, Y, and Z. And uh, it's educational. So, uh, you know, the, the power of the erudition of critics is compelling. And uh, that keeps them afloat in my book. Also, the power of celebrity. 
you know, very, very, very famous critics and critics who have amazing social connections with lots of other celebrities, uh, they can have a huge amount of influence purely because they move in circles that you're well aware of. And uh, it's interesting to watch and follow them. And of course, you're mindful of the power they have with their social connections and the access they have to other celebrities and people of note. Um, we have, what was, that, was that a good thing you just said? Or? Well, I think it can be very interesting if, you know, if a critic is also a celebrity and a celebrity with very oh, interesting God, and powerful no, connections. That's the worst, because you've got them making completely anodyne comments when discussing anything that has anything to do with any of their mates. And then when they start slagging something off, you have to think, oh, well, you just clearly don't know anyone who has anything to do with that. Or you've read this list that you all have and you're part of the gang. Perhaps, but they give you insights that perhaps you might not get anybody get from anyone else who doesn't have the same access. And also, they might. it's entertaining. Well, another point is uh, critics who are incredibly consistent. Yes. If you find a critic who you agree with, and as you move along with that critic through time and you look at all of the books or films or art that they uh, produce critiques for, and you find yourself nodding and saying, yes, that's exactly how I feel. Yes, I actually saw that exhibition. Mm. I thought precisely the mm. same. Then you have the power of the authority of consistency. And you find yourself thinking, okay, well, I can take this person and they mm. can predict. Indeed. And they start steering you towards what you should see, what you shouldn't see, yes. and you become a follower. And I think that's a very powerful aspect of critics as well. I actually don't think that's ever happened. But what I will say about that, and I think we've discussed this before, is how um, critics should state their benchmarks. Uh, reading a, a movie review or whatever, that critic should say at the top of the review, these are what I consider to be the best films in the world. And then you know whether or not they're taking them seriously. For example, Kermode, his uh, favourite films that he often says are Citizen Kane, that's perfect, according to him. Mary Poppins, that's perfect, according to him. And The Exorcist, that's the best film ever, according to him. I completely discount everything he has to say about everything based on that. No, but surely you would take you would take his judgments or his critiques with a huge pinch of salt. Perhaps, but certainly on a case by case basis. I mean, if he again, he could describe a film to you and he could do so in terms of the merits and demerits of that film in isolation of all other influences. You know, he could describe the film in terms of its structure, in terms of its suspense, in terms of its plot devices, and everything else that may influence him as a person and his general outlook may be irrelevant in his dissection of that particular film. Yeah, but it rarely is. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. I'm sure there are other uh, reviewers. Um, actually, funny enough, there are occasionally people who stand in for him, which I tend to... Uh agree with a little bit more and plus also um again we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier which is how they have a, there's like an agenda i think certain groups of uh, critics or viewers or pundits in general generally have a kind of list of what to praise and what to you know should we move on to the sort of things that can affect a critic's viewpoint? Yes, indeed. The last on the list of power of critics, I think I should uh, mention, is something that we've just been discussing, which is the, uh, the ability of critics to, to analyze something, but also to compare and to contrast it with something else that may be associated with whatever it is or related in some way. Mm. So comparing things, contrasting things, drawing relationships between two different works mm. uh, for example i think that is quite uh, a useful power of a useful critic but moving on to uh how critics formulate their opinions and uh, what affects their opinions over time uh, there are a lot of things that i can imagine i mean i can certainly imagine how a critic can reach burnout i mean you know if you're a, a hot dog uh, connoisseur and critic uh, you may get sick to death of hot dogs and you never want to eat another hot dog again and the very idea of a hot dog just makes you want to throw up uh, so it becomes extremely difficult to recommend hot dogs or to really get excited about hot dogs and uh, perhaps your career as a hot dog reviewer is over at that point but again because of the economy and because of capitalism 
uh, perhaps you just have to just grind on and uh, continue to review hot dogs. Well, and I think this is a problem. Euthanasia? Yeah, I think I think selective euthanasia for for critics who have uh, who have reached burnout uh, could be uh, implemented. But you know, boredom, burnout, uh, reviewers become highly apathetic and, and massively cynical. I think everybody does, and whatever they do. Uh, become cynical at, at some point. Yeah, but cynicism is a main draw for a lot of people. I mean, I'll admit that I like listening to uh, Mark Commode sometimes because I like it when he hates a film. So, yeah. Well, it's the entertainment factor. It's purely entertainment. Uh, but sometimes he hates a film that I really like. And again, it makes me... Um... But is it cheap? I mean, is it cheap just to have I a rant? I do feel cheap. I do feel cheap for having enjoyed listening to him rant. And plus, also, I think he is rent a rant in many ways. You know, he, he's he's paid for his, doing his thing. And I think, you know, a lot of these people are. You really um, have it in for this chap. I, you know what? I guess it just shows how little I... Or how... Um, what's the opposite of O'Fay? anti <laughs> How anti I am with uh, the world of professional critics. I guess basically it comes from my background as a music maker. I should just, I'll get this anecdote out of the way because this is part of my fuel really for my trenchant views. Is that the right word? Okay. It's, um, I used to really like a band called Radiohead. Everyone likes Radiohead. Never who's, heard of them. Who's cool. Yeah. And uh, they came out with a record called um, Kid A. Which I thought loved was po- it. Well, mm, very polarizing. It's a bit challenging to my ears. Uh, and up to that point, I've been a real Radiohead fan. Um, really, absolutely, just adored them and their music. Um, anyway, so Kid A came out, and it was a departure. And they were kind of, um, I don't know how you'd call it, but they were kind of in a bit of a bad place because their third album was just unanimously praised to to the moon. And so they kind of had a breakdown of some sorts and came out with this very experimental album called Kid A. Now, the NME championed this record. They gave it 10 out of 10. I think New they did. Musical Express? Yeah, I think it was 10 out of 10. I might be wrong about that. But whatever it is, that they were like, well, hey, this is um, really something to look out for. Uh, pop that in the show notes. Yes. Whereas at the time, uh, the NME had a rival rag called The Melody Maker. It's now defunct. Now, their review was um pretty bad they really trashed it um they i can't remember any of the specifics about it but i think they said something like oh whatever they 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 just had a really really terrible review now i couldn't help but think their bad review was somehow to do with their rival championing it it just seemed like that to me and uh, it kind of got me thinking about why some reviewers praise things and why some reviewers, um, the, the, the same things that they'll diss. And I just don't seem to think it's actually about the content. I don't think it's that at all. I think it's all political. Well, I suppose it would be. I mean, if, if you can imagine, let's say there's a new album that's been released and your job is to review that album. But the newspaper down the road have just reviewed that album. Now, you may think precisely as the reviewer down the road does about that album, but you have column inches to fill. (laughs) You have to write about it. It, You cannot say the same things, even though you may feel and think the same things, because that would be too close to plagiarism. And you need to do something original to set yourself apart. So you're sort of almost coerced into lying. (laughs) Well, into sort of being economical Dishonest. with your review. To wow. an extent. I mean, I suppose, I, I don't know if this ever happens, but I would hope it would. Hmm. That, And again, perhaps this is the cabal that, uh, or the pack mentality of critics. Maybe this is how it happens. But I would like to think that people are honest and critics would just say, you know what, I can't put it better than the critic down the road. I think he captured everything I wanted to say no. about this. Therefore, I'm not going to review it. I'll just agree and move on to something else. Well, at the top of the program, I said ego plays a big part in what they do. Um, And so I think they'd never do something like that because they're too busy puffing up their chests and um, standing tall and sneering and mocking. Um, That's just my cynical view. Well, something else that uh, affects a critic's viewpoint, of course, is sponsorship, is uh, the, the hand that feeds them. Uh, they're not going to want to denigrate the people who are providing for their mortgages. Uh, so they're, they're, 
they're steered a little bit by that. Uh, they don't want to lose work, obviously. They don't want to lose interviews or access to whomever is responsible for the content that they review. Um, they become shills uh, working for a particular paying corporation. Indeed. Uh, there are moral and uh, political agendas uh, which affect how a critic views the world. Um, you know, they may be heavily against a particular distribution method for a particular type of uh, art and uh, whatever it produces or is associated with whatever that distribution method is, they'll just rubbish because they want it to die, because mm. they believe it to be a poison for the art. And they can feel quite passionately about the way in which uh, the the warp and weft of uh, whatever it is, the field that they occupy you see i think that's again just as bad as the worst because it's very manipulative that kind of thing that you find that um certain outlets uh kind of are they're kind of ranting about something some moral or political could be moral or political uh, agenda that they're um, pushing well if they have an agenda they're an activist they want to change the way you think. But, they want to make changes. But they're pundits or they're reviewers or something like that. But they're kind of... Um, well, I feel slightly manipulated. I'm not, going to go into, I'm not going to say by whom. But there are times when I certainly feel as though what the pundit is saying is there's something wrong with you if you don't feel like I do about this particular cause or topic or whatever. Which, Which is I indefensibly mean, awful. It is. It's it absolutely happens all the, the time. That's terrible. It happens all the time on the BBC. But also social links, uh, that can heavily affect a critic's viewpoint, of course. Um, you're not going to want to rubbish someone's film if you would really like to interview that person. And this, I think, would particularly play if there is a director of a film, for instance, who has, in the past, produced films that you thought were fantastic. You never had the opportunity to interview them at the time, but now, perhaps as your career has catapulted into the stratosphere, have the access to this director. However, he's just produced a completely terrible film. Say it's Woody Allen. <laughs> he's, has a, his latest annual film is absolutely horrific. Now, you want to interview this man, but you really don't want to have to face talking about this particular film. What do you do, especially if you're forced to talk about it? Funny enough, that did happen with um, Madonna's film, W.E., which you must have heard about. Never just heard pure, of it. Really? Just from the reviews of it. It's just, well, basically. Is this new, is it? It's a kind of retelling of the Edward and Mrs. Simpson story. Right. And it's a little bit more pro the Nazi sympathizing mm -hmm. king that we almost had. Yeah. Um, and it had, oh, it's, it, it, now I've not seen the film, but it, I can imagine it really is dreadful. And anyway, uh, the actress, the, re the real favourite actress at the moment, uh, Andrea Riseborough, who everyone seems to always mention how amazing she is, even in completely unrelated conversations, they'll go on about how amazing she is. She was in um, uh, Oblivion, by the way. Did you notice her? That was Tom Cruise's wife to begin with. She had red hair. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, anyway. Um, but uh, Simon Mayo interviewed Andrea Riseborough um, because she's in WE. But he's a DJ on Radio 5. He is, but he's also one half of the film. Oh, so he interviews... Yeah, yeah, he interviews oh, films. So he, he's a film critic. Well, he, him and Mark Commode are the two hosts of the film, the flagship film. I show. knew that, but I didnn't realise he interviewed people on, and, and is a film critic in his own right. Uh, I can, maybe not a critic. I think he's just like the host, right? I suppose. And Mark Kermode is like the guest. I don't, I don't know. Anyway, but he, it was real masterful how he was not talking about how rubbish this film was when that's what everyone's been talking about. And instead, you know, talking about the finer details of the dancing and the costumes and <laughs> everything but this enormous elephant in the well, room. Well, that, that's something else that affects uh, a critic in his critiques. And that is uh, consistency. I mean, it becomes difficult if they have a consistent line on a particular aspect of something. And then something comes along which overturns their opinion. So I can imagine change is difficult mm. for a critic. Yeah. Because they, they're producing a canon of works. And they don't want to invalidate their previous works. Yeah. Ego. So they must... 
continue with their line of reasoning despite the fact that it's now exactly it becomes dishonest they're narcissists <laughs> moving on physical state i think uh i certainly have read a few reviews by people who are plastered uh when they are listening to the music or at the play and uh their subsequent reviews have been spotty uh you know these people are wanting to have a good time wanting to get into whatever it is they're wanting to get into and perhaps they overzealously affect their judgment and i think uh in terms of music i would have thought that we've mentioned this but i think the the current state your current state how you are right now listening to the music is heavily influenced by everything the environment is everything and you know how you are right now i mean yeah, you know you can yeah, enjoy yeah, something and then subsequently you can think oh that was really awful but boy yeah, did i enjoy it at the time well, so that's that perhaps a good critic communicates that well yeah it's funny you should say that because i i do think it's the case where um some people might not be in a f- particularly funny mood when they're watching a, a comedy and think it's not funny for example yes that must happen all the time absolutely well famously uh, things are funnier when you hear people's laughter that's true if you're watching something with a bunch of people and you're all laughing at the same thing like I, i've seen your I've, mood can be elevated yeah absolutely i've watched something where i've not even smiled through it but when i'm watching the same thing with a bunch of people yeah that's a weird thing anyway a strange phenomenon also um the pack you are influenced as a critic by other critics you move in the same pack uh, you're part of the same family you see the same faces again and again and again. You're going to ally. You're going to harmonize to a certain extent or not. But certainly you're heavily influenced by other critics. As we mentioned, if the critic down the road says one thing, perhaps that will steer mm. the way in which you feel about whatever it is you're reviewing. Um, types of criticism. There are different types of criticism. I have read fabulous reviews of books which have just completely thrilled me and, and, and just made me run out and buy the book immediately to read it. Even by reviewers who I've, you know, who's, I've, I've never heard of, but they put together such a fantastic review or critique of a book. I just thought, wow, that is amazing. Did it live up? Just, just, just the, the other day, I was just, review. just the other day, I was listening to a, a review. Uh, rather, it was a panel discussion about various things, but there was an author on the panel and the author was describing his book and the other panelists were just blown away okay. they just thought we're going to immediately run out of the studio after recording and buy this book it just sounds fabulous who, who was that i don't remember i'll pop it in the show notes but it was on slate's podcast oh, right. um which i thoroughly recommend it's absolutely fabulous and uh, except for the women who are all young americans and they suffer from a phenomenon called the creek so they have heavily staccato voices which tail off into haggery and it's amazing they sort of sound like this and it's really weird to hear young american that sounds like um something called a a death rattle sort of like that but it really is very awful Uh, however on slate uh, especially the culture gab fest i'll put the link in the show notes uh, they are all really really very intelligent really razor sharp very entertaining fantastic for book reviews film reviews and whatnot it's mostly what i listen to is in terms of uh, critics but the types of criticism range massively uh we have the vindictive critique uh which again is highly entertaining it certainly can be um sometimes quite cringeworthy and, and toe curling uh you get it from artists and critics or even between artists occasionally there's the famous interview between norman mailer and gore vidal which was just awful a television interview feud debacle that was just worth watching it's on youtube and it's just incredibly horrifying but it's certainly worth watching um we have cheap shot and poor quality criticism uh, everywhere Snar- snarky criticism that's what that is snide snarky pointless ego fueled yeah. it's just really bad insult reviews yeah just this just hey it's actually just there, there is another one called, which, which might also come under that which is um the kind of review that you have uh embedded in satire like 
the, like uh, The Onion, for example. You know that film? Satirical. Yeah. Critique. That film has come out called The Internship. And The Onion ran this really uh, biting piece of, I don't know what you'd call it. Have you, have you seen Comedy it? satire, no? Comedy satire, yeah. They're just saying it's going to be the biggest hit of 2005. <laughs> <laughs> Clever. Um, analytical and academic criticism, we've already discussed, but uh, it really is sometimes fabulous to listen to somebody who really knows what they're talking about. And they can take something that you've seen and that you appreciate it and just elevate it by a scale of magnitude. Things and they'll bring things up that you didn't even realize. It's just absolutely fantastic. But we're rushing towards the end of the podcast here. There's only a few minutes left, so I'll uh, try and whip through this little list as quickly as possible. We also have uh, criticism as a basic discrimination. You know, we criticize to make choices. We we are critical to uh, to help us uh, move forward. And a lot of critics will just make quick snap decisions, and they'll do it in, a, in an efficient way, which will just provoke us to move in a particular direction. This is the sheepification of all of us when it comes to the massive deluge of media that is available generally. Uh, opportunistic criticism. This is any chance critics have in order to inflate their profile, to pump up their ego, to try and make themselves a little bit more visible. And they'll, they, they strike a balance between genuine, solid, well-thought-out output and just cheap shots that may slightly burn their credibility to an extent, but it's opportunistic and it allows them to get a little bit more of the limelight. So it's hit and miss sometimes, but uh, there are a lot of calculated reviews out there that uh, critics will foist upon us purely in order to steal the limelight away from somebody else or to increase their profile. And uh, that's terrible. Again, it's a game and it's a job, and it suffers from all of the negative aspects of capitalist society that we all live in, but uh, perhaps that's for another podcast. And uh, almost lastly, who pays the critics? Who pays for them? Who buys their stuff? How do the works of critics get to us, and how is it supporting their livelihoods? I've often wondered this. I suppose I've always thought that they are freelancers, and they're selling pieces of work, essays or articles like any freelance writer, or that's effectively what they're doing. So they'll sell their time as a performance artist or a stand-up, or they'll sell a, a published piece of work to a publication. And uh, I suppose whichever publication purchases that piece of work can try and ascertain the popularity of the piece of work. How they do that, I have absolutely no idea. I'm sure an editor just takes a view, surveys and focus groups and whatnot. But uh, there are also full-time critics, critics who are on the staff. Uh, they work for one organization or one institution, um, and uh, they're on a salary. So again, they are unable to perhaps criticize fully the products of their benefactor, mm, yeah, and that may steer their the decision. And perhaps they they take direction from that organization mm. in what they can and cannot talk about, which again limits them. They are blinkered critics. And perhaps as a generalization, you might consider a critic who does work on the staff of a particular organization as a uh, blinkered. So. Yeah. And uh, there are the, uh, the hobbyists, the many billions of hobbyist critics out there who uh, run their blogs and uh, have discussions and, and sometimes, I have to say, I find they have incredibly valid things to say, and there's a lot of talent out there. And I think technology, the internet, and uh, what have you, gives uh, access uh, to a lot of people who have a lot of interesting things to say. But they can often have a dog in the fight, um, and it's difficult to uh, not take what they say with a pinch of salt. I think you're right. I mean, it's, uh, it's tough. But uh, again, it's difficult to find what you want to find, but when you do want to find something in this world and on the internet, <laughs> you can find what you want mm. and you can find a critic who thinks exactly how you think. And then you're well, on the consistency train. You can in theory, but it doesn't really happen. There are a couple of interesting websites on the internet that I find uh, quite pertinent. Uh, one is metacritic.com 
Uh, it's a very large website full of interesting reviews, but uh, it's owned by a very large broadcaster, an American broadcaster, CBS Interactive, who own thousands of content producing channels in every possible area of the arts and sciences. And again, some of the reviews can can be a little bit biased. They can certainly show confirmation bias. And uh, a lot of the reviews are conspicuous by what they aren't saying. Yes, indeed. Um, RottenTomatoes.com, very popular destination for film reviews. It's slightly different from other review sites in that it is an aggregate. It takes on board all of the reviews for a film. It's mostly films. Do they review anything else? And it's just yeah, it's films. usually films. I only know that. I'm sure most people know that from Wikipedia pages of films will often cite uh, what Rotten Tomatoes thinks of something. You know, Keith Lemon, the movie, zero percent score on Rotten Tomatoes. But then they example. list a whole bunch of external reviews. If you click on it, yeah. Yeah, so it's just a bunch yeah, of reviews, yeah, and just, you can click on... It's just an yeah. aggregator. Yeah, so that's quite interesting. But again, owned by some kind of content pr- producer. It? Flickster is uh, some sort of content producer, I'm sure. Right. Uh, internet web movie streaming company or something like that. I think. Flickster, isn't it? I think so. Pop that into uh, the show notes. And uh, career critics. And I guess professional critics are... Almost always career critics. I've never heard of a a critic who has moved on to do something else, or a critic who's moved on to actually make films. Charlie Brooker, didn't he make a film? Funny you should say Charlie Brooker. I was actually thinking that when we do the wrap-up of this show, I'm going to say, I wish I'd mentioned Charlie Brooker. Um, yeah, what's the question? The question is, is, he was a critic, but he actually moved on and started producing content. Oh yeah, he did. I mean, he still is a critic and a pundit and a general... Um, nonsense talker. He's um, yeah. He he's on my crap list. He really is. He's just uh, very snide, very sneering. Um, just has a face you want to punch. Him and Mark Kermode. Um, just to end, I think we should have a few uh, quotations which I which I found which I think uh, Smug. are, are quite interesting. He um, here's one from Chris Rock. I think he's a stand-up comedian and actor. He famously said, "You don't need a critic." to tell you people aren't laughing which is true again as you said earlier um comedy is interesting stand-up comedy is interesting in that you have instant feedback you really can you have the audience with you at second by second you can tell when you're dying you can tell when you're doing well they're literally there for you it's you're watching your own volumes Mm. and and uh, that's interesting whereas uh in a play you're reading your lines. You're acting as best you can. You're, you, you're, you're mindful of your rehearsals, you, you but you have a on, stony-faced crowd. No, you, you you base it on how many people aren't sleeping. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, the covers of this book are too far apart. Ambrose Bierce. Um, it's true. I mean, certainly, I've always felt that most things are too long. <laughs> oh, I see. Yes. Possibly this podcast, but books, novel form to me just seems incredibly ah, long i mean I, I i didn't know what that meant i understand that a novel reflects is typically the product of years of an author's toil i mean it's a passion and it's it's literally years um but they're long and uh, they can be heavily flawed and i certainly think that writers can fall into a sort of search bubble effect where they just cannot see the wood for the trees, and they really do need to be told. And the power of editors length. when it comes to writing uh, you see, is no, incredible. No, but the thing is with that, though, um, is publishers want books to be long because they want to be able to charge more money for them. Yes, absolutely. The format is defined on economic grounds a lot of the time, and I've often thought about the, uh, music and songs. They all seem so similar in length and timing, and it's just, you know, they're just little well, that's, units. That's radio play. Oh, yeah, no one wants to play a 10-minute song. No, indeed. Um, don't criticize what you don't understand, son. You never walked in that man's shoes. Huh. Of course, that's Elvis Presley. Brilliant. And it's true. So all of those reviewers who really have nothing to do with what they review, you sort of think, well, there's the stealing the magic argument. They are reviewing something that they're passionate about and they feel they know a lot about and yet have never produced, does that give them an advantage, or does it disadvantage 
Difficult to say. Mm. It depends what it is, I suppose. It's a case-by-case basis. Criticism demands infinitely more culture than artistic creation. That was uh, Pierre Bayard, How to Talk About Books You Haven't Read. And uh, he seems to suggest that uh, criticism is a lot more dicey and a lot more complicated than the actual creation of whatever it is you're cre- you're criticizing. And I think that's certainly true in some respects. I mean, when I think of contemporary art, for instance, I mean, to criticize or to write a critique, especially considering the history and the, the derivation of a, a piece of art, the art may well have taken five minutes and it w- may well have been a... I hate this word, visceral and emotional explosion on the part of the artist. But the reviewer really has all of his work ahead of him, and it's a considerable amount of work. But that's just what I think. However, I think we should wrap up. Um, Please visit eclecticist.co.uk for the show notes. Uh, You can find uh, our wrap-up session as well if you really want to listen to that. It's about how we think we did in this podcast and what we think we didn't talk about and all the problems that we think it had, uh, but it could be an interesting listen. And of course it has the show notes. This is our working document that we use when we produce this podcast. And uh, please send any feedback, any comments or anything at all to our contact page, which you will find at the bottom of the main webpage. Um, Our musical choice uh, on this show is another open source piece of music that uh, I thought was very good. It's a solo piano piece by Torley. It's called Civilization Survives, and it's from his collection of solo piano pieces called RRPM, or Really Repetitive Piano Music, uh, recorded about 2008 or somewhere around there. I particularly like it because I'm really into uh, Philip Glass and Steve Reich and very repetitive sort of uh, atonal and understandably horrible music that nobody else likes. Uh, But this is actually quite melodious. It's from archive.org's community audio section, which I highly recommend. And uh, it has a very kindly license, uh, so you can just download all of that music and pop it onto anything you like and uh, and thoroughly enjoy it, like I do. Uh, Thank you very much for listening to Eclecticist Podcast. I just want to say um, the last word on the subject uh, of this edition is uh, for people to make up their own minds when it comes to criticism. Anyway, goodbye. Thank you. Mm-hmm.